electronics, all these things. But a student, I mean, they really feel uh, that they do not get an idea of how can we apply these concepts in to real world problems. How does these subjects fit into the uh, overall petroleum exploration and production? So that was the whole idea behind uh, uh, today's uh, webinar. And so just to uh, start with, uh, I'll give my brief introduction. So I graduated from IIT Roorkee uh, back in 2014. And currently I am working uh, full time as found uh, as at Planet Geology, which is an upcoming uh, online platform for uh, exam related preparation, especially from geoscience uh, examinations. And uh, a part time I'm working as guest faculty at KL University. I'm teaching uh, MSc geology students for GSI examination as well as for uh, gate examination and any other examination that are conducted from earth science discipline as a whole. Uh, prior to this, I have worked at Shell uh, from 2014 to 17, then at ONGC from 2017 to 2019, and then uh, December 2018. Then I worked as graduate assistant at the University of Texas at Austin. And since last year, I have been here uh, working at Yale University as well as at Planet Geology. Uh, some of the achievements. So again, GATE 2017, I got AIR1 in geology and geophysics. Uh, in other competitive examinations also, I've scored pretty high. GMAT score, I got like really high. I could have got like, it is way above uh, the GMAT standard GMAT scores of even like the best MBA colleges, Harvard, Stanford, their averages are like 710, 20. But uh, I don't like really want to go to MBA at the moment. So I start, I found like teaching is more of my uh, passion. So I'm focusing at the moment mostly on the teaching part. So the agenda for today's presentation will be, we'll uh, see, go over what is petroleum geoscience, uh, what has been its history, some historical perspective, what are different categories that we, we can divide it into. And uh, I'm assuming I'll go through like the really basics, assuming like because most of these will be students here. So I'm just assuming like you don't know much about how oil and gas industry works, what are different disciplines and how do they integrate with one another. We'll study like very briefly about petroleum systems. I think if you have studied a petroleum geology course in uh, your university, you will be already familiar with this thing. Then uh, different disciplines in petroleum geoscience and what are skills that are required for, for a petroleum geoscientist, which are really important. And uh, for the just to sh just to show how all these things integrate together and uh, how do we solve problems in geology, especially in petroleum geology. Uh, I have a case study that is from my own research paper, which was pub uh, which has been published uh, this year only. Uh, so this is, this is related to uh, an oil field, which is the biggest oil field in India, the Mumbai high oil field. And there is a particular issue with the oil water contact in that field. So I, I'll briefly discuss that too, just to show uh, a practical application of things that we study. So Geology actually is a discipline within earth science. So earth science is an overall umbrella uh, science which includes many sub-disciplines, ge geology, geophysics, uh, meteorology, oceanography, all these come under uh, earth science. So geology is a discipline within earth science and it is study of earth, its composition, processes, its history and even its future. So and that is like the real power where it comes from because things that have happened have happened. But what we really want to do is predict what can happen in future and prediction not related to future, but prediction is a very powerful tool that we will use even in petroleum uh, exploration and production. And petroleum geoscience encompasses all those disciplines within geology that are of particular relevance to understanding of petroleum systems. Now uh, for geology, I mean, I don't know how many of you are geologists, participants are geologists here, but for most of the disciplines, and uh, but by no means all, but for many disciplines, most of the time is spent sitting on a desk uh, or staring at a computer screen, just maybe writing some codes or doing Excel entries, manipulating some tables in Excel. But a significant part of geology, and this is like one of the best parts of geology is 
that the laboratory is mother earth and your work itself will take you to many exotic locations so these are pictures which have been collected by me only from different locations in different countries some of some of them are from india only from himalayan mountain belt for example the one you see here some of them are from spain and a few of them are from the united states so geology itself like just your work will be a significant not all but a significant part of your work will be outside in the field hiking camping all those things will be part of your work so in that regard it is very very exciting discipline and don't think like if you're a petroleum geologist uh, most of the people when you talk about field oil field comes to the mind but for to a geologist oil field is not a field it's just like you're visiting the site but geological field is where you can see outcrops uh, when you when you go to oil field everything is in the subsurface you cannot really see the rocks so even if you are a petroleum geologist because you cannot see you cannot imagine your reservoirs uh, just by let's say one dimensional well logs or even seismic so you need to look at real outcrops where you can imagine your reservoirs so this field geological field work is a significant uh, component or at least part of the learning experience of petroleum geologist now uh, what is history of um, i mean development of geology in the oil and gas sector so some oil reserves have been known since millennia i mean even before people knew uh, even before there was distillation technology uh, people could extract gasoline diesel from crude oil but they were still using crude oil for some for example lighting lamps and all those things and these uses they, they were they were used for like many many thousands of years and in most of those cases the as you see in this picture here people were not like drilling for oil or actively looking for it it's just like in some surfaces uh, in some places in world because oil is lighter than water and most of the sub, sub, sub if you go under sub surface if you have sedimentary rocks and you have pore spaces in in between those sedimentary rocks those pore spaces are are not like empty pore spaces they are filled with water and in this zones which are very close to surface may be some air but if you go below a particular depth all your pores are saturated with water except in places where you will find oil so oil is naturally lighter than water so what will be the normal tendency is it will rise to the surface and in places where there is no entrapment that oil is not getting trapped so it will automatically seep to the surface and you will find as you see in the in this picture here these are oil seeps in some places there will be gas seeps or pock marks is when you form like small craters if uh, this uh, see gas seepage is have happening under water so initially there was nothing no active exploration no active looking out for oil it's just like whatever comes to the surface whatever you see on the surface you tap it and there was not huge demand for oil also but as demand for oil was picking up so people they was they started looking for uh, they actively started looking for oil even in those places where it was not seeping out onto the surface it was trapped in the subsurface and uh, it was at that time that understanding of anticlinal accumulations of oil uh, um, started understanding so anticline is any structure in the uh, subsurface you see which you, it, it looks something like this so i mean there are some different people use different definitions but for uh, you guys the basic definition of anticline will be it's normally a structure like this and this is where like uh, these hydrocarbon traps are forming so it's like it is trapped due to gravity only it's just like normally what you think of opposite as gravity so if you have a bowl like this and you fill it with water so so the thing is this outside boundary of bowl is impermeable so there is no permeability so it acts as a seal and then in the bowl the water is there so it is because gravity is pushing it down so it is staying in the bowl only it is not moving out it is not uh, spilling from the sides so anticline is like opposite of this bowl so what will happen over there is because gravity buoyancy is also a type of gravity it is just acting in opposite direction so in water when oil is present in water so a very similar phenomena will happen and your oil will get trapped 
uh, and underneath there will be water so instead of air it will be water and because in this case due to buoyancy the force will be upwards because oil is lighter than water so it's just like you invert a bowl or for example if you trap some air in the bowl so you need similarly some sort of seal but overall this type of accumulation is known as what we call as anticlinal accumulation so this will be under anticlinal accumulation so during the next half century this basic idea underwent many developments because oil was found in great variety of structural positions so this was the very basic one the first one that was understood so but after this a lot of different types of traps or structural trap configurations and many times in stratigraphic uh, configurations they were also discovered or they were also being found so it underwent many developments and the period from 1910 to 1935 is generally known as the golden age of petroleum geology because it is at this time that inquiry into basic questions of what is origin of petroleum how does it migrate from source to the reservoir and how does it get entrapped because we saw like normally it tries to come to the surface and it will form a seep but why is it not forming seeps in all the case why is it that some cases it is getting trapped so all these questions started appearing 1910 to 1935 and after that there was some lull because people thought they have actually found out most of the things that they need to find out uh, oil was easy to find then in starting 1960s 1970s oil was discovered in the middle east there were big discoveries and they were all easy finds but in the recent years you see after 2005 2001 so most of the easy oil so the stuff that is easy to find has already been uh, has already been captured or has already been found out so what is remaining for the next generation for us for you guys is actually the oil which is very hard to find so you need to work really hard of these basic concepts will not work uh, always the oil is getting trapped in configurations in regions which are not easy you are going under the salt you are looking deep deep water deposits you are looking for so or some things which are very very fragmented highly faulted areas oil sands are being uh, looked into so uh, now it is more of uh, like conventional stuff is already discovered we are more into non conventional domain sorry yeah so Uh, if you look here i think it should be should be able to do this yeah okay i don't know what is happening it's uh, let me see if i can erase this yeah yeah i don't know why it's still keeping these in next slides also yeah yeah so i mean you if you want to categorize petroleum geology there are many different fields that you can come up with but the, at the very basic level i'll say there are two main disciplines one is exploration geology and second is production geology so exploration is really i mean it's self evident it is related to finding new oil pools or things that you do not already know sometimes people actually include extension of existing oil fields into exploration geology some of them so there is slight uh, a gray area between these things but whenever you are finding new oil that you have already not proved that will come under exploration and production is it's not like if you have found that there is oil here and then it's easy job that reservoir engineers can come in production technologists can come in and they can drill wells and just recover it you need a geologist because once you have found uh, uh, oil in reservoirs re reservoirs can be very heterogeneous they 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 can have a behavior which you cannot predict if you do not model these if you do not have a good understanding of the subsurface geology so even in production you will see a lot of uh, a lot of input that comes from uh, geologists and it is geologists who build these uh, static reservoir models which uh, are then used by uh, reservoir engineers to uh, <clears throat> to see how the pressure will decline 
or how the recovery will change over time um, as you drill more wells and as you pump more oil. So in both these uh, branches, uh, exploration as well as production, you will see that geologists are actively involved. In fact, I think geologists play the most important role because if you cannot find oil, then you cannot produce it. So exploration geology as well as production geologies are the two main uh, two main categories. Uh, other than that, you can categorize into subcategories: geochemistry, geophysics, paleontology, well site geology. There are some people will be specialized stratigraphers, specialized sedimentologists, specialized structural geologists. So all those uh, categories can come in, but overall these all these can fit into either exploration or production because you'll need all of them in both these stages. Uh, another thing, uh, exploration is actually quite risky and it is it, uh, it involves a lot of money also. So you need like really good geologists in exploration geology stage also who can uh, understand what is really in the subsurface because you cannot see the rocks that are there. Sometimes you're, uh, you're recovering from kilometers of depth. It can vary from uh, 1,000 kilometers to sometimes like even as, as high as 5,000 kilometers. Yeah, so why I put this slide here, the main idea is, uh, why do we actually need geologists? Let's say if you want to find oil and the easiest thing which even a child can think of is just go blindly just to use brute force and try drilling everywhere now try to drill everywhere and somewhere you'll find oil because people usually do not understand the concept like how can we narrow down to areas where we, we have to find oil so an oil well maximum diameter actually and that's also on surface that you can have will be let's say one meter that is a big exaggeration but still let's assume it is one meter now, India is a country which has total land surface area, excluding this uh, continental shelf area, is 3.287 million square kilometers. Now, if you put one meter diameter wells here, just to cover the entire country, you will require 4.2 trillion wells. So that is not at all possible. So that is like the stupidest thing that you can do, but it can work. See, it's like if you have unlimited resources, unlimited workforce, then you can go and put wells everywhere and somewhere you will find oil and you keep going deeper and deeper as much, let's say five kilometer drill, well, drill everywhere. But you don't want to do this because you see, even if like, let's say you drill these wells at some distance that you assume there will be some continuity in the reservoir, but you will need a lot of wells to do this. So we need some, some criteria. In the early days, we saw oil would automate the, for some traps which are very easy to find. And when demand was not huge, you can directly go where it is seeping to the surface. You go drill in those locations, very easy stuff. But the oil which is hidden inside the surface, how do you discover this? And this is for exactly that purpose that you require geological knowledge, geological understanding. How does a petroleum system work? Because just by sitting there, just if you have knowledge, you can ignore a large part of it and in turn save a lot of money. So what you do in that case, first of all, most of the oil that you'll see is in sedimentary basin. You need a sedimentary basin. Reservoirs, okay, there can be some reservoirs which are not sedimentary in character, but overall petroleum system will always be in a sedimentary basin. So in India, you can actually, even before uh, doing anything, any field survey, you can just sit at home, look at some maps, and you can decide which of these will be my prospective, or not say prospective, or interesting areas. So here, uh, these, uh, these are like uh, sedimentary basins. In India, they are categorized into different categories, depending on their status, but we'll not go into those details. We'll just, it's just to show here where those sedimentary basins mostly are. And some of them are actually not very interesting. For example, here, the one you see in 21, these are mostly intra-trappian sedimentary rocks uh, that are present within Deccan volcanics. So there is like very little chance you'll find oil. So already, and these dotted ones are like, most of them are metasedimentary rocks or they have been affected by tectonics, uh, except here, it's mostly alluvium. But the interesting thing is like you have already narrowed down your area, but you, there is still a lot of area that is that you have to cover. Maybe instead of four trillion wells, you need one trillion wells now, but still you cannot go and drill everywhere in a sedimentary 
basin. And we'll understand like why petroleum reserves are found only in sedimentary basin. So yeah, next step, you know, like you're still better than this going. So in the previous slide you saw everywhere you drill, no, you still narrow down a little bit. Now you are, you, you know, from your geological understanding that uh, oil will be found in sedimentary basins. And this information that oil is found in sedimentary basin, basins is not trivial. We found that today we consider it to be uh, as given, but back in the days when petroleum uh, exploration was still developing, people had different theories, mantle origin of oil, extraterrestrial origin of oil. They didn't understand like it is formed from remains of living organisms and all those things. So uh, even this information is where our, our, our areas of interest is non-trivial. Now uh, in basic, uh, 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 say narrow, further narrowing down our areas of interest. So our main challenge is to go from millions of squares of kilometer to few hundreds of squares of kilometers there you can actually uh, focus your energy, focus your resources and money. And finally, after you identify an interesting area, you'll have to finally give a location to drill a well so that you can actually test until you drill a well and produce oil. Everything is conjecture. Everything is uh, just assumptions, uh, just thinking that there could be oil. So final discovery you will only call when you drill a well and you strike oil. So large areas of uh, interest. So drilling well, well is uh, drilling a well is an expensive, uh, expensive uh, activity. So you need to do some activities which are less expensive and which can give you, which can narrow down your area of interest. So large areas of interest are initially subject to surveys to detect large scale features of the subsurface geology and generate leads. And these are usually gravity surveys, magnetic surveys, and regional seismic. So for example, gravity, uh, if you are surveying a seismic base, uh, a sedimentary basin, sedimentary rocks are usually porous. And especially if they have hydrocarbons, hydrocarbon is light. So you would expect, for example, the gravity, uh, uh, if you're moving to a sedimentary basin, gravity will, will be less. So you're looking for uh, gravity anomalies where uh, you see that the gravity is not what you expect. So anom anomaly is anything which is uh, different from what you expect. So these are usually low resolution surveys, uh, surveys. They do not give you a lot of detail, but they can uh, definitely generate some leads where you can go and say, okay, this is my area of interest. You can neglect some areas that no, I'm not going to see anything here. Uh, maybe sedimentary cover is very thin. Maybe if I drill like just hundred meters, I will see hard metamorphic or igneous rocks. And usually in those areas, your uh, gravity will be higher. So gravity, we usually take value 9.8 meter per second, 9.81, which you study, but that is an average value that you take. Gravity actually varies from surface to, from a place to place as you go on earth. Okay. So uh, the, the, these are usually low resolution and seismic also. So seismic, if you are not aware, uh, it's just like uh, when you go to hospitals, you do ultrasound where you're sending uh, sound waves um, or acoustic waves and they get reflected from different parts of your body and then they are recorded back. So in case of a seismic surveys uh, in geology, what you do is you have, uh, you have your uh, a source at surface, which is generating these waves. So let me uh, try to draw something here so that I can show you guys. Uh, let's draw. So usually you will have, let's say these are different there'll be different layers within the surface and maybe some of them are like an anticline and this is your surface and surface you will have a source and this source will generate seismic waves and they will get reflected of these layers that you see here and you study them at receivers so here you will study these waves and that there are like very sophisticated tools uh, or machinery that you use to detect these and finally process these and find and then interpret these. So this is again, not an easy task, but this can be, this is now well established in the industry and this can help you uh, with the, uh, with understanding the subsurface. For example, here you see is an example of a seismic, uh, size, uh, example of a seismic section. 
so after these detailed seismic uh, regional seismic surveys uh, things what you can do is you can then generate some leads and then once you have narrowed down your area of interest you do detailed seismic survey so this is one of the requirements so what the thing that you are seeing here is actually a result of detailed seismic survey in many cases these are 3d seismic surveys which means uh, they can actually give you 3d volume they are very the seismic lines are very narrowly spaced uh, and though they can they will give you a very detailed picture of subsurface where are your uh, structural traps where are your uh, uh, highs where where could be your source rocks what could be migration pathways all these things will uh, come due to uh, leads and then you will identify a prospect and evaluate and uh, evaluate it so it will be based on analysis of these seismic surveys and then finally you will drill an exploration well in an attempt to conclusively determine presence or absence of oil and gas so conclusive evidence you will only get after you drill a well and produce oil onto the surface now uh, this actually i wanted to show animation but it's not working very well here so what i'm uh, i want to show here so you saw this image here you had so much of wells then finally you are let's say narrowed down your area to a very small area and you drill a few wells here but again your job is not finished here because once you drill wells and wells is the truth that is the, the rocks you see you see rock cuttings you acquire logs over there but again you know you have data where you have exactly drilled the wells and if this is your complete field you do not have any information what is in between and this is where you extrapolate and this is where uh, uh, your geological knowledge will come into place and oh, what geologists will actually do is they will utilize the information for example what what they have gathered from sub from surface outcrops which are actually visible and modern day analogs so they look at modern depositional environments for example and then say okay what based on what you find you see in these wells what could be in the middle and that gives you predictive capability so this is the main thing you need to have predictive capabilities it is not just an academic exercise so that i have fourth the four wells here where should i drill my fifth well if i drill my fifth well randomly anywhere it's just waste of money you'll spend crores uh, on drilling a well and then you'll not get anything so to reduce your errors to give uh, more chances of discovery so uh, you will use your geological understanding in that case so petroleum system i just put here because uh, many many people they are not uh, they might not be aware of it but those who have studied petroleum geology in university they will be aware of this so we have main uh, ingredients of a petroleum system is the source rock uh, the reservoir source reservoir trap seal migration and timing i will not go into details of each of these because that will consume a lot of time i'll just tell you uh, very quickly what these are source rock is a rock which uh, will generate oil usually these are shales uh, organic highly organic rich mostly found in conditions where oxygen is uh, lacking because if there is oxygen it will decompose the organic matter and it will not be preserved for uh, generation of uh, petroleum so they are usually fine grained and mostly they are shales marl or very fine grained limestone in some cases then reservoir is actually the place so here for example this you see the black thing here so this layer is actually source rock and then reservoir is the part which is uh, which will store oil so reservoir actually has very different properties from uh, compared to source rock better source rock are usually impermeable very fine grained reservoirs good reservoirs usually have coarse uh, coarse grain size high porosities high permeability so that they can store oil and high porosities are not actually very good for uh, preservation of source rock because if the if the pore space is there air can actually penetrate uh, into this uh, source rock and then it can oxidize the organic material so they will almost in most cases will have opposite properties so source rock where you generate oil reservoir is where you store oil but you know we have we have seen since first slide that oil is lighter than water so if it just continues to the surface if there is no trap it will just seep onto the surface so it will just come somewhere here on the surface and then there will not be any entrapment inside the surface so to trap oil inside the surface you need an entrapment condition and that is known as a trap and usually trap uh, will involve a seal in most cases seal is just like you had bowl of water your bowl of water is act, so the bowl is acting as 
seal it is not letting water escape you cannot form you cannot store water in a cloth because cloth is permeable it will not it is not acting as a seal so here seal will seal is an impermeable rock which will not which will uh, stop further movement of oil so seal can be considered as part of trap also but trap is usually considered overall structural arrangement then migration is nothing it is a uh, uh, travel or path um, it is path that uh, oil is taking it is generated in the source rock and then finally it migrates to the reservoir where it is stored and timing is very important because what you see here i i'll tell you what timing means what you see here is a static picture of what is existing today but geology or earth is a dynamic planet we do not have things which remain constant or uh, throughout um, constant in time they are actually changing so if this trap let's say this anticline you see here if this trap should form before migration happens if this trap has formed after migration then there will be no entrapment and oil will escape to the surface so that is what comes under timing so usually if you go for interviews to ongc uh, or oil india so these this this is very important that you should know what each of these ingredients are and usually they will be very happy if you tell them timing usually people forget they will usually tell first five and they will and if you i've seen like in interviews if you tell timing they will be very happy and they'll say yeah this is what we wanted to hear so and this another thing which is very important for uh, interviews is this overall process of uh, prospect generation and uh, understanding how you actually narrow down your areas how you generate leads uh, and those processes of exploration that is very important if you are uh, going for interview for any of these oil companies so let me raise whatever is there in this slide also all this one yeah so uh, now i'll quickly go through uh, what are main disciplines in petroleum geology so that you can understand if uh, any of you go to work in the oil oil industry what will be expected of you and what things you will be giving and then you can choose like your area of interest what you want to uh, what you want to uh, so specialize into so the first thing that you'll see the very basic discipline is sedimentary geology or sedimentology so i think you already know what sedimentary rocks are there are there are three main three three main types of rocks sedimentary igneous and metamorphic igneous are formed by uh, crystallization of molten magma metamorphic rocks are formed by transformation of pre existing igneous sedimentary or even metamorphic rocks due to high pressure and temperature for example if you make bricks from clay that is sort of a metamorphic process although that's not natural usually geologists will not call it but it is a good analog uh sedimentary rocks are formed or sediments are formed by if there are pre existing rocks they will get uh, they will be eroded and weathered and these products will be carried to some basin where they will be deposited and finally buried under pressure and due to cementation lithification they will form this sediments soft sediment for example sand or mud they will form sedimentary rocks and most of the reservoirs are sedimentary rocks and all of your source rocks are Uh, sedimentary rock so reservoirs you see sometimes fractured metamorphic and igneous rocks can also be there but source rock definitely are uh, a sedimentary rock and reservoirs in ma majority of the cases are sedimentary rocks and so that is why sedimentology is the most basic discipline that comes under ge geology and it involves all factor that go into erosion transport and accumulation of sediments main sedimentary rocks so it is see sandstone are usually coarse grained Uh, they are mostly rich in quartz they may have some lithic fragments feldspars and then there are limestones which are again calcium carbonate that they mo in most of the cases they are derived from uh, remains of uh, animals for for example some animals they uh, excrete out uh, uh, outer shell that is made of calcium carbonate they accumulate over time and they will form limestone then there are shales silt stone these are usually fine grain shales will usually act as your source rock so and they will form from mud or silt they are very very fine grain so these are different types of uh, sedimentary rocks that you study for in sedimentology now uh, a lot of people they might not be aware and this is like one of the first things that fascinated me when i uh, came to petroleum geology was things that we were studying in uh, plate tectonics that india was at one point of time part of australia it was attached to antarctica 
they were like mostly academic but when you look at uh, when you started started studying petroleum geosciences and we started to see like no these actually have huge huge applications in the uh, petroleum sciences and they are not just like academic and exercises which you can just out of curiosity you will do they have real applications and uh, right now i'm sitting in vijayawada and from here we are do, um, doing this webinar and if you look uh, at the rocks uh, or i mean we are very close to krishna godavari basin the city is on krishna uh, banks of krishna river and krishna godavari basin is one of the uh, proliferous basins in india in terms of uh, oil um, Oil, oil and gas resources and if you look at like why do we find oil in here and if you go further south in kaveri basin so the history you can actually trace it back with tectonics and that will also help you when you are studying like narrowing down using your geology from coming to 4 trillion wells to maybe you have to drill 3 4 wells in a prospective area so all this understanding will come into play so here for example uh, i should have actually mentioned here that the first one that this picture that you see here i'll annotate it so this is the one you see here is from jurassic so this is from jurassic and this is from cretaceous so jurassic uh, you would have seen jurassic park movies at the times of dinosaurs even cretaceous there were dinosaurs but by end of cretaceous the dinosaurs had uh, got extinct so this is older than 66 million years old this is around this is earth what probably what earth looked like around 90 million years uh, so it spans a long time this is what probably earth what looked like um, around 200 million years uh, ago so you see in this part see here so this is india that you see and this is australia this is antarctica so all part single they are in part of single um, single big, uh, continent and uh, what happened like after some time the rifting started this is what rift developed and due to this rifting you see india has now so this india is here indian cretaceous it has separated from from antarctic and australia so this west coast of india that you see here uh, sorry east coast of india was attached to uh, this coast of antarctica so now geologists they can actually uh, figure out what lo because we are studying these rift environments uh, in today's uh, in the present day world so we actually know what kind of deposition you'll see in these uh, in these scenarios and they can actually go back in time and uh, visualize what could have uh, uh, what could have been the sedimentary environment in those days so this is where exactly where like this sedimentation started in the krishna godavari basin at the time when rifting started it was an active margin and then slowly it turned to a passive margin as india uh, drifted started drifting north and you see another thing here so these are very very powerful and they explain why you see resources where you see a lot of petroleum resources if you look here in canada alberta this part you see it was all shallow seas so in cretaceous your sea level was much higher than what you see today earth was much, much warmer and even at those time there were probably no ice caps even uh, at the poles so much much warmer world than today much higher sea levels and a lot of these parts you see they were actually flooded with water so if you go to these areas where you see, see this light blue area shallow seas this is the middle east part saudi arabia iraq iran where you see the biggest oil reserves of the world and similarly here venezuela and in near california texas america so they were all shallow seas uh, and you can actually recreate these uh, plate tectonic configurations and this can this will actually give you uh, this will actually give you uh, predictions in future for example there are some areas which you have not drilled so it, it can actually tell you okay where should i go and drill my wells and it explains most of the resources now india also you see here a big uh, shallow continental shelf area but you don't see much oil reserves in india corresponding to this part because this was mostly consumed due to uh, due during collision of india with uh, with asia and this is what you see seismic section of these areas and you can actually see that history of rifting of continental rift here in these seismic sections you see a lot of normal faults so this is your what you see here is your basement rocks and on top you see 
initially there was no sedimentation all metamorphic or igneous rocks and that these layered rocks that you see are all sedimentary rocks and these started depositing not in this stage but after india drifted from uh, from the from antarctic and australia yeah so uh, again i should erase these so understanding structural geology now we have already seen that is why do we use structural geology so that we can understand entrapment condition so we have already discussed this i'll not spend too much time on this but structural geology will deal with actually uh, faulting in a given reserve for example here you see you can see a fault related trap and here you see an anticlinal trap so all these things you will study uh, in in as part of structural geology and uh, sometimes you will see if there is any risk to your entrapment for example faults can act as seal as well as they can act as leakage points where if this is a permeable zone actually this oil can leak to the surface so these all these parts come under domain of structural geology and in in certain case uh, in certain scenarios it is actually also related to uh, your tectonics so you need to have a good understanding of tectonics if you want to be a good structural geologist now stratigraphy and especially sequence stratigraphy sequence stratigraphy is a discipline which is actually uh, a uh, i'll say gift from oil and gas industry only it has been developed by oil and gas industry and because they had like massive massive data uh, from seismic sections and they could observe different sequences and i think it was the work most of the work was done by uh, exon mobile geologists um, there is this concept of sequence stratigraphy and basic definition of stratigraphy is study of rock strata or layers and you will see this mostly in sedimentary basins that you see these rocks are deposited in layers and you saw that from this seismic section also you see where you have these sedimentary rocks they are deposited as layers and sequence stratigraphy studies rock layers as sequences and explains these stratigraphic units in terms of variations in sediment supply and changes in relative sea level so usually why do we call these sequences they will be bounded by some unconformity surfaces unconformities are nothing if there is no deposition happening at a place and the rocks get exposed that part is known as unconformity so the sequence will be bounded between two unconformities and they they these how these these patterns that you see here they 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 are determined by interplay between sedimentation rate as well as change of relative sea level so uh, we are sitting in uh, if on east coast of india close to vijayawada if you could go back to time let's say 10 million years ago you would see that coastline was actually uh, would have been much towards the west it due to sediment deposition it has progressed towards the sea so all these changes that you can track uh, you can i don't know what this happened let me use this yeah sorry guys yeah so you can actually track those changes due to sea level variations and what will happen now why do you want to do this because you cannot again as we see as geologists we have to be smart we cannot go and drill at every place we need to generate leads we need to tell locations where we need to drill wells so these will actually tell you how your depositional environment is shifting what kind of deposits you will find in a particular place well whether there will be a reservoir rock or not so for example here you see all these let's assume these yellow ones are reservoirs so you build these models and you can say actually that yeah you have not drilled here but we are based on my understanding geological understanding and sequence stratigraphy i can say that these species they are progressing towards this side and uh, you are seeing uh, uh, reservoirs in this part so again it provides significant predictive power so we need predictive power because we need to generate leads we need to give prospects and that is the main thing again uh, next we come to i don't know what is this happening paleontology so paleontology is study of what fossils tell us and you will be wondering why do we study dinosaurs fossils in what what effect will it have in paleontology but uh, it's not just like dinosaurs paleontology is not just dinosaurs all you study all sorts of fossils and mostly in oil and gas exploration it is the fossils which are very small or micro fossils which are very important and some of the important why why are they important one thing is index first 
the concept of index fossils they are like markers and they help us and identify and correlate different layers now if you're drilling a well you cannot really see what is underneath in the ground and you need evidences okay let's say you wanted to drill a well let's say uh, let me show this to you using a drawing let's say we were saying like we want to target this anticlinal trap and there are many layers of rock on top so this is my area of interest and you start to drill a well here and when you are drilling you don't know which part you are in you go here you go here but what will happen let's say you have drilled a well previously somewhere here and you see that a particular kind of fossil comes here so you are drill you are studying these cuttings of rock that are coming to the surface and then you can actually identify yeah this is my fossil this is my marker horizon so this is one of the applications of so i should stop my drilling or which areas i have uh, arrived in this part okay. i don't know this is going so this is one of the applications of um, um, paleontology so that is during drilling they can help us monitor drilling sometimes they can actually also indicate maturity of petroleum so maturity when we are studying uh, those source rocks so maturity is actually uh, uh, an attribute of source rock whether it is mature or not so oil will usually be formed at a certain temperature which is called as oil window it is usually between uh, 60 degrees celsius to 150 or uh, 160 degrees celsius and uh, whether that temperature has reached or not because if you go deep inside the earth your or if you your depth is increasing your temperature will also increase so uh, and what you will actually observe is present day depth but that is not determining whether hydrocarbon is generated or not and the depth you are actually encountering is in the reservoir but what you actually want to see is has it reached that in the past because rocks they can get buried and they can get uplifted also so these uh, some fossils such as conodonts they can get give you an idea of maturity of petroleum and then because different animals they live in different environments they can also tell you what kind of depositional environment is there was it a river was it a beach was it deep marine these sort of things and examples that you have here for example if you go to uh, the summit of mount everest so it is uh, almost like 9 kilometers above mean sea level rated for it and you see the top of mount everest is actually a sedimentary rocks and if you can have a microscope and zoom into it you will see little like crinoid fossils so i mean just by looking at that thing you can sort of get an idea that what you see at top of the world at the moment was actually deposited deep uh, inside an ocean so there was uh, it, these rocks were at one point of time deposited in ocean and so that is sort of like giving you and just by this information without doing too expensive analysis or anything you you have been able to interpret what was the depositional environment and in, in any given setting and another what you see here for example this is what uh, i actually pictured in the field and this is a rudist colony and you don't need to again if if you just see this you can know like yeah i am in the mesozoic uh, my age is older than 66 million years ago because these organisms are now extinct and this is a limestone and if you look at like most of the deposits in the world they are all cretaceous in age so this is actually a very interesting find and Uh, it is well established but just by like little bit of information can give you so little bit of like data can give you so much of information uh, i don't know why this is happening okay. yeah coming to the next slide we yeah, have paleontology you've seen another is geochemistry and there are like even some some of them i'll not cover there are others also geophysics maybe geomechanics also but i'm just giving you overall idea so geochemistry deals with uh, studying the chemistry of oil or uh, source rock or uh, kerogen which is generating oil and you can divide oil into different parts and main application is to identify source rocks uh, determine the amount type and maturation level of organic matter and then another is evaluate potential timing of petroleum migration when did oil migrate because again remember that slide we talked about timing is very important because if my migration is happening after formation of structural trap then it is not a good thing i want my timing to be before so then you do not waste your money and see because if you say timing of my migration was uh, let's say 20 million years ago and trap formed actually 
only five million years ago. You can date those. Then there is no point in wasting your money and drilling a well over there. So that is why it can help uh, uh, help in uh, oil exploration and then assess potential migration pathways and correlate petroleum compounds from different reservoirs. Let's say you have two different reservoirs uh, at two different places, and then you want to see whether they are from same source or different source. So they help in correlation also. Now we'll quickly come to different skills which are relevant to petroleum geology. Uh, I think we are already short of time, so I'll just rush through these slides. So well log co correlation, we have already seen what well logs are. Log is nothing, it is just like uh, deriving some, uh, actually you record this information and uh, what you do is in reality, you just have log is nothing, a record and you correlate different reservoirs between different logs. When you come to core interpretation, that is a very skill, a very important skill that geologists need to have. You, you need to actually look at the rocks many times like geologists think they can sit on computer and they would do some correlation, do some fancy stuff, make really nice maps with colors, but that is not the main part of geology. So if you're a geologist, your main part is to interpret these rocks. Just by looking at this rock, can you see what, what, what could be the depositional environment? If you know the depositional environment and you know that I see it at one particular place, what will be the extent of it? How extensive is it going to be? And usually these are done like this is an example of uh, core interpretation that has been done with hand. And these, these, this is actual data because logs are also like recordings on these rocks, electric uh, resistivity measurements or uh, let's say travel time measurements, uh, gamma ray measurements, all those things. So these are measurements. They are not direct uh, data about the rock type. So this is the ground truth. Core interpretation will give you ground truth. And then building conceptual geological models. The, again, an important part of geologist's job because this again gives you predictive power. Uh, if you build these models, then you can say, okay, I, for example, in this case, these are my sand bodies. This is where I will find my, uh, find my reservoirs and this is where I need to drill and I do not need to drill in other parts. So again, don't waste your money. So these are just examples of different depositional models that you have to build and they are very important in oil exploration as, as well as in, in production. And then seismic interpretation, seismic we already talked about, you are just sending acoustic or sound waves, which, uh, sound waves to the uh, deep inside the surface and then you are recording them as they come back in the receivers and you do some processing, uh, use some sophisticated tools to get an idea. Also. So you get this sort of seismic sections and then comes geologists and geophysicists who actually interpret these seismic sections and they will actually tell you what is happening and then you can use these uh, to identify prospects. For example, you see in this case, you see these units, they have been interpreted as uh, canyons which have cut into this pre-existing surfaces. So these parts here. Yeah, again, then uh, this is like really into the domain of production development geology, not into exploration site, is that you have to build 3D static reservoir models. So all this geological understanding from conceptual geological models, well correlation, and from uh, petrophysical properties that are recorded in wells, you combine all that to, to give you integrated 3D reservoir models. So these are usually static models. So static means they will not tell you how the oil will flow and all those things. They are saying you what is existing in place, what are the properties of rocks, that will be the sweet spots. So sweet spots are where you drill well, then you get a good amount of oil. So all these you will build 3D static reservoir models. And these reservoir models, usually they will go to reservoir engineers who will simulate uh, oil flow or production of uh, oil from these, uh, from these models and see how it will behave in future. How will water come into the reservoir? Uh, how will oil production rates vary? How will the reservoir pressure vary? How will the gas content in the reservoir vary with time? So that will all be reservoir engineering domain. But with, what will geologists do is they will build these 3D reservoir models to give, give to give you uh, to give you a static understanding of the subsurface environment. And then you source rock characterization this is more important from exploration point of view so you need to know what is the 
well, what is the character of your source rock, whether it is mature or not, uh, whether there is enough organic content, whether hydrogen by carbon ratio is, uh, is enough or not. So all these things, they will come under, uh, they will come under source rock estimation. Um, also all these things. So you need to know whether my source rock is mature because if there is no source, then there is no point in going to a particular area. So source rock is one of the basic requirements that you need. So uh, finally, I'm going to finish with small case study. It will not take much time. Uh, I will try to keep it very short. Uh, so this is actually the paper which I published myself uh, and it is related to uh, the biggest oil field in India, Mumbai High. Uh, and what I'm going to do is, yeah, so what I'm going to do is I will uh, quickly give you the, what is the problem, what is the challenge that you're facing, uh, or actually see in this field and how, how that is tackled. So this is the map of uh, Mumbai High oil field. And uh, what, you, what is peculiar about this oil field is, if you look at the contact between oil and water, it is actually tilt, not flat. And what are you seeing here? If you have, let's say, glass of water, no matter how you tilt it, the surf, the contact between air and water will always remain flat due to gravity. So you cannot have tilted because otherwise water will flow. So this, just like this, the, the red one here is gas and the green one here is oil. So, and the blue one is water. So just like you see this contact between gas and uh, oil, it's, it's flat. It should also be flat. And in most of the cases it is observed flat. So why do you see is, uh, it as a tilted oil water contact? So that is one of the problems that I try to address. And you see in this map also, you see where it is cutting. These are structural contours. They are equal elevation lines. And if it is cutting means elevation is not same everywhere. So what could have been the reasons? And this sort of like shows you uh, an understanding how you integrate different areas, different disciplines so that you can come under, uh, so that you can get an idea of what is happening. In So uh, let's go to the next slide and just show you. So the explanation that I came up with, and I mean, it was a big literature review, difficult convincing people, but I'll try to tell you in the shortest possible way. It's just like if you tilt this glass, as I told, glass will tilt, but water air surface will remain constant. So what you see in Mumbai high, this structure as has actually tilted through time. So you have, what you have to do is you have to go back in time, reconstruct, uh, remove the top layers and see how these thicknesses are varying in different areas. So we're trying to do here is that we're trying to recreate this history and find, try to find why this could tilting could have happened. We observe this tilting. We can actually recreate it. We can, from wells, we can see from thickness variation, we can see it. But again, another thing is what could be the reasons? So for that reasons, you will again do literature review, you do some analytical studies and you see that one thing is a lot of sediment is coming here. So if you stand on bed where you're standing, the mattress will go down. It's just like if you're depositing a lot of sediment here, so that is resulting in this lithospheric loading, which is tilting this plate downwards in this area. So it is tilting the lithosphere down and that tilting itself so again, you will cause like if I tilt the glass, it will not, I mean, your oil water contact should re-equilibrate, but it should remain flat. So what could have resulted in, uh, I mean, it not getting uh, equilibrated. And the reason is, we'll study that reason also. So these, these, what is the, the tools that you see here in this case. So this is just like reconstruction going back in time. This is what was the scenario at time of deposition, then what is happening later on. And then this is the present day scenario where you see this trap is nicely established, but you see it is tilting in this side. So if migration has happened, oil migration has happened before this tilting. So the, the hypothesis is that the tilting of the structure has caused, uh, has caused this tilt in oil water contact. And you can see these here between two wells, A and B, which are de de deposited uh, along this. I don't know who is annotating this slide hello and all. I think you guys should not have to erase these. Yeah. So this is what is happening. So now after this, uh, these are two wells that were uh, that were seen A and B, 
and you could see like where this tilting this, these actually give you tilting as how the tilting has happened you can see that a which is further towards the flank has tilted more than uh, sorry b has tilted more than a so uh, this is the hypothesis but then the question is what could have caused that you know, could caused this to tilt the water why why has your oil water contact not reequilibrated for example if it gets tilted why did it remain tilted it should actually flow back and become flat again so i mean uh, the hypothesis in this this case is that if you look at carbonate reservoir diagenesis is an important part and diagenesis is just like any changes cementation or different changes that are happening or dissolution that is happening after deposition of sedimentary rock and that has actually diagenesis is very different in presence of oil and absence of oil so during the initial structure this oil actually uh, established a flat oil water contact but diagenesis was actually enhanced in the oil leg and not in the uh, enhanced in the water leg and not in the oil leg this resulted in rocks becoming very tight in the uh, in the water zone and then when it got tilted they almost acted like a seal and another reason is actually wettability of of uh, these carbonate rocks so they are usually oil wet so you actually need negative pressures to move that oil up of the rock so combination of uh, this uh, differential diagenesis in oil leg and water leg as well as uh, oil wet nature of uh, these limestones resulted in uh, resulted in uh this development of the oil water contact but in this study we used we took use of tectonics we used like this sedimentary load which is coming so sediment we borrowed from that and again burial history geochemistry all these things when when is the migration time for example here uh, these are all systems so when was source rock when was the seal developed when was order and what was the formation of trap so all these concepts that we studied they integrate and then they can help us uh develop this understanding and again this has predictive for example you have drilled well only here so if you do not know this understanding you will say okay if it is flat it will extend only up to here then you will miss all the oil that is on the flank so if you can establish this conceptual understanding that oil water is tilted and why it is tilted then you can actually predict yeah my i can find more oil if i drill further flankward so finally summarizing what we have uh, studied until now so petroleum geosciences is the most crucial discipline within petroleum sciences if you cannot find oil you cannot produce it so we are the first ones exploration geology and production geology are the two main branches within this and uh, we studied this concept how we can narrow down our area from uh, huge areas to very few hundreds of square kilometers and finally come up with prospects we studied petroleum system concept of source reservoir trap seal migration and timing and then we studied different disciplines within uh, within petroleum geosciences and what are different skills required and then finally we went to case study of mumbai high oil water contact where we studied this um, problem of why there is uh, why there is uh, the tilt in oil water contact and we established that it is due to post oil migration structural deformation so with this uh, we finish it uh, thank you guys for being with us and if there are any questions i will uh, try to answer those so but we have to finish i think before uh, 7 i say 50 because i have another class also that that needs to be taken care of okay so any questions thank you for the wonderful session sir Uh, now like we would move on to much anticipated moment from the audience mm -hmm. that is q and a session please drop your questions in the chat box before yeah, you yeah. do that i would like to tell you that only those questions would be accepted which are on the topic application of geology in petroleum exploration and production so please yeah, drop actually, the question I in the can, chat box i can see that there are already some questions most of these are related to certificates i think uh, you will be able to better answer those i'll try to answer anything that are related to uh, this sir i would read down to you okay okay you can tell me like any question that you yeah. um yeah, what so is the, the main difference between petroleum engineering and petroleum geology Mm -hmm. okay 
So yeah, petroleum geology and petroleum engineering, they are actually very different disciplines, although they will work together uh, in most cases, but geology is trying to understand what is inside the surface. What is the static picture? Okay. So let's say if you have a fridge and you have vegetables and all those things. So you are trying to make a map of your fridge. Okay. This is where this is situated. This is where I've kept my water bottles. This is where I kept my eyes. This is where uh, I have kept uh, different food items, building a static picture of subsurface. So that is what geology will be. So, and you need a lot of geological understanding, earth history. You need to know what earth's history has been, uh, where I can find my oil, how will I generate prospects, uh, what are my reservoir properties, what kind of rock will find. So what kind of rock actually contains oil? So all these things will come under geosciences discipline. But, uh, but, but then after that, uh, you, you come to petroleum engineering and they're actually more interested in producing that oil. So you understand, you will try to apply uh, concepts of engineering for, for example, fluid mechanics uh, or uh, continuum mechanics and all those things and how pressure will change through time. How will, if, you, if I produce at this rate, what will happen in my pipe, I'm flowing, how much, uh, what will be the character of the flow in the pipe, how much gas I will get. So all those questions, they will come under petroleum, petroleum engineering part. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Here comes the second question. Sir, can you explain the timing concept again? Yes. So we understood like different uh, ingredients in a petroleum system. We studied source, reservoir, field, trap, migration and timing. So how, how does oil get trapped? So oil getting trapped is something. So first you need to form a trap. So trap is a structural arrangement of rocks, which will inhibit further movement of oil. So for example, if you have a cup of water, so a cup of water is like a trap. Okay. So if you put pour water in a cup, it will stay in the cup. If you pour water on ground, it will not stay. It will try to flow away. Okay. So a trap is just like a cup. Only thing is you put the cup opposite. So upright down because oil is flowing from below to up. So it is going towards trying to go towards the surface because it is lighter than uh, lighter than water. So it's just like a cup, which is opposite. Now cup is existing. Okay. So if I turn my tap on before I say putting the cup there. So my, let's say, and all, and so from my tap, let's say tap is my source. Okay. And the water that is coming out is oil. So it's coming out water, but I need to trap something. So in this case, I'm in bowl, I'm in cup, I'm trapping water. So the water is coming. And if I, let's say, put water, uh, put my, if what source is there, oil is also generated, but my cup itself is not there. So what will happen if I don't put my cup, all that water will go into the sink. So that is what happen if there is no trap, oil will come to the surface and after all your water has finished and then you bring the cup, it is of no use. So the same thing happens with traps. So traps, they are usually forming due to tectonics, due to structures, for example, compression. So if trap is forming after oil has already migrated, already generated, then there is no point. So I have everything. I have trap, I have source, but trap was generated after migration. So that is a timing concept and timing. That is why timing is very important. So you need to you need geologists, they will carry out structural reconstructions and they will tell you when this trap actually formed. It is not possible in all cases, but in some cases it is possible. And then you can actually see whether this prospect is interesting or not. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Next question. What might be the prime reasons for Mumbai high OWC, oil water contact? You see, oil water contact, uh, we see uh, mostly oil water contact should be flat. So if you have water in cup, it, the, the surface between water and air should be flat because of gravity. Because if it is tilted, it should again re-equilibrate. It should come back because fluid will flow. It is not, uh, if it is solid, it can stay tilted, but otherwise it is not. So for Mumbai High, we studied main reason. First of all, that is an observation that oil water contact is tilted and that observation you get from many different uh, uh, wells that we have drilled in the field. So we know that is existing. Now, why it is existing? That is sort of someone needs to answer and who answers that geologists need to answer. And one of the reason is that we put, let's say if this, uh, you have water in cup and you tilt the cup. So it's just like, 
hypothesis is that oil water contact got tilted along with that tilting of trap so trap is not stationary it got tilted and yeah so if it got tilted then what will happen due to tilting somehow the oil water contact did not get tilted it did not achieve equilibrium and one of the reasons was one is like getting cemented in the water like so where you had water it forms sort of a seal and another thing is so you will study like wettability is for example property of sticking to something so if you have foam you dip it in water you take it out so even though gravity is pulling water down it will not flow it will stick to the foam so something like that is happening even the structure got tilted but oil is still st sticking to the rock so that is another reason why we have tilted oil water contact in mumbai okay thank you sir uh, this might be the last question yeah. sir as you have said that shell is most productive reservoir but recently ongc has stopped working on shell production why uh can i can you repeat the question again sir as you have said that shell is most productive reservoir okay but recently shale. okay 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 yeah shell yeah, yeah okay yeah um, but recently ongc has stopped working on shell production why so shale i wouldn't say it's most most productive reservoir it's actually less productive more productive is sandstone shale is like we have in many places we have actually already produced from sandstone so it is not there so easy oil is gone in shales actually it is very difficult to produce oil from shale it is not permeable it is just like a uh, solid rock there are no pore space there are pore spaces but permeability is very very low so it it doesn't flow on its own so shale comes under unconventional categories and uh, there are many challenges that are associated with it it is not an easy task uh, so shale reserves are huge across the world and it has been i think the only place it has really been successful is the united states it has not been successful anywhere else and why ongc probably stopped is actually in shale you require it should have very good properties uh, it should have very good source rock properties there should be enough uh, enough oil in there it should have at least some silt content so that you can uh, do it and another is technical challenges that you need to frack you need to frack shale fracking is just like you pump high pressured water hydraulic fracking and then that creates cracks in the shale and cracks cracks actually act as permeable pathways for oil to come so there are many technical challenges first is availability of water in many places in india wherever this issue came up like the shale gas will be developed so there were a lot of protest for example in kaveri basin in chennai where there is shortage of water because they the people were scared that uh, ground water will be used in because a lot of water is actually required for fracking some in some cases if those cracks they uh, come to the close to the water table they will contaminate water in the water table so there are technical challenges and another thing is in india there are actually very few places where you have good shale with good properties that can actually be developed uh, another fracking it's not uh, it's not cheap it is also very expensive so you have to look at economics also in the present day environment it is actually if if you are trying to develop shale in india it will be more expensive than just purchasing oil because oil is so cheap these days so that that is another reason Um, as we have completed the Q&A session, I would pass it on to Nikhil Agarwal to conclude this session. Yeah, thanks to all for your valuable time and cooperation to make the event successful. I, on behalf of the Petroleum Engineers Association, thanking Lawrence Canyon sir for his presence and providing us time for his busy schedule. Thanking him for his informative and valuable presentation. Hope. all of you have enjoyed this knowledge sharing session i am thankful to for all your active participation i extend my big thanks to all my team members for their extensive support and uh, the question regarding certificate yes you all will get certificate within 7 days and those who have question they can share us on our official mail id we will forward to faculty and he will answer and we will get back to you thanks to everyone thank you guys thank you for having me Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Uh, I'll stop the video now. Yes, you can.
go for your other works also bro yeah sure yeah if there, there's anything you can uh, ask me tomorrow because i, yeah, I, sure I have sure. okay yeah okay. okay thank you thank you nikhil thanks a lot and thank, thank you so much for having me very time sir it was really nice to okay yeah yeah we will provide you certificate and uh, i will and you can post in question in our email okay yeah if there are any questions uh, i'll answer those in email also because of and, uh, uh, shortage of time we'll have to leave here okay and uh, you, next session is tomorrow that is on hydraulic fracturing okay so we want that uh, hope you will all participate in tomorrow session also okay. thanks again